turn to the first chapter of Genesis again. The first chapter of Genesis. And uh, several, several weeks we're probably going to be in Genesis 1, Genesis 2. Uh, normally we take about a chapter at a time and go all the way through the Bible, uh, but with Genesis we need to take a little bit more time on the first few chapters especially, and then as we get further into the book, uh, we will plan to take it a chapter at a time. Let's pray before we uh, begin our study. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will be honored and glorified in this service today. In Sunday school, Lord, bless each teacher as they teach your word, and Lord, help us to learn facts and figures, things perhaps we did not know, but more importantly, Holy Spirit, please apply your truth to our hearts. You said all these things that are written are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So these things are for our learning. They're for our lives today. We know that your word is timeless. So please speak to our hearts now through your word. Help us to give you our full attention. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, last week we didn't get past verse 1 and 2 because we looked at several other verses as well. But I just want to do a little bit of review each week, at least until we get through the first few chapters of Genesis. And uh, let's just review Genesis 1, 1 and 2. It says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, God. Not in the beginning, spinning dot. Not in the beginning, big bang. In the beginning, God. And notice, in the beginning, that's time. God created time. God created, that word means out of nothing. The heaven, that's space. And the earth, that's matter. So he created time, he created space, he created matter. Uh, it's like the, the little joke I told you last week, an uh, uh, atheist who said, well, God, I guess we, we maybe should believe in you, but we don't. And uh, you know what? Man's pretty advanced now. We can make our own people. We can create our own people. And so he said, let's have a contest. And so the man reached down to get some dirt to make a man, and God said, hold on, get your own dirt. You know, the fact is God created everything. He created the matter to make everything. So when the Bible says that God created, it means out of nothing. He took nothing and he made something. He made time, the beginning. He dwells outside of time. He is eternal. And again, the best way I can try to describe that, because we, we are not eternal in the same way God is in this way. There, there, have, there has been a time in the past where we did not exist. But from the moment we're born, there will never be a time when we will not exist from that point forward. We are eternal in the aspect that we will spend eternity somewhere. So we are eternal in that aspect, but we are not eternal in the sense that we have no beginning. We do have a beginning, but God has no beginning. And so again, the best way I can try to illustrate that is if you wrote a story and you saw the beginning and you saw the end and you knew everything in between, you're outside of that story. You created that story you dwell outside of it. Well, God dwells outside of time. The Bible makes it clear He is eternal. So He created time. He created space, the heaven. He created the matter, earth. And uh, then notice verse 2. It says, And the earth was without form. And by the way, notice it doesn't say it became without form. There are people who teach there's a big gap between verse 1 and verse 2, and that there was a an earth God had created before, and then it was destroyed from some catastrophe, and then it was just sitting there for millions and millions of years until God decided to do something with it. No, God created it without form. He created it void, and no one was living there. He created the material to make the earth, the skies we see today. The earth was without form and void. People didn't live there. Animals didn't live there yet. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. It was covered in water. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Scientists have said, there's proof. Everything's been covered with water. Well, actually, they're right. It was covered with water in the very beginning when God first created everything. And it was, created, it was covered in water again at the worldwide flood, which we will study in Genesis as well. But notice the Bible says, verse 2, and the Spirit of God, there's force. So we have time, we have space, we have matter. The Spirit of God, He's the force, moved, we have motion upon the face of the water. So again, what you believe about that verse, verse 1, determines all of your belief system. All of us, listen, all of us believe something by faith. All of us, and here's why it's by faith we weren't there. And so we're taking somebody else's word for it. We're taking somebody's word for what happened in the beginning. It's either in the beginning God, 
or it's in the beginning, as I said, what I was taught in the public school, that literally that everything you see, and I don't just mean in this room, I mean in the entire universe, in the entire, uh, all the galaxies, everything you see was packed into something as small as a period on your page. And it was so dense, and it was spinning and spinning and spinning, and kabloom, kablooey, and here we are, you know, after millions and millions of years. So that's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. As I've said the illustrations before, you see something that's been designed, what does that tell you? There's a designer. You see something that's intricate, that works well, what does that tell you? There's a designer behind it. Well, there's no doubt. I mean, just common sense tells us there's a designer. Romans 1 says people are without excuse because they see God's creation. They have no excuse to say, well, I didn't know there wasn't a God. I didn't know there was a law of God. No, we have no excuse because we see God's creation. And the Bible makes it clear that anyone who says in their heart, there is no God, that is a fool who says there is no God. We look at all the evidence and say there's no God, you're a foolish person, the Bible says very clearly. Um, and by the way, people say, well, all the scientists agree with evolution. No, they don't. I read many examples last week of scientists who said it's obvious, it's obvious that this world was designed by someone. Not all, not all those sciences, scientists are Bible-believing Christians, but many of them recognize this didn't just happen by accident. You know, you, you don't take a, a bunch of letters and throw them in a dryer for millions and millions of years and suddenly a Webster's Dictionary pops out. You know, you don't take watch parts and throw them together and have explosion. Order does not come from chaos. It doesn't. There had to be a designer. And there is a designer, and it is God. Now, we didn't get all the way through last week's lesson, so I want to end with last week's, I want to begin, rather, with the end of last week's lesson. Let's go to Job 38. Job 38. And I want us to see here in Job 38, and by the way, the Bible's filled with clues like these. There are some people who are against studying science at all, and I'm absolutely for studying science, but let me, let me say this. You need to be very careful what you claim is science. The Bible talks about oppositions of science falsely so-called. They're falsely so-called science if they don't meet the definition of science. Well, what is science? It has to be able to be, does anybody know? It has to be, we said this last week, you have to be able to repeat it. You have to be able to demonstrate it, and it has to be what? It has to be observed. If you can't observe it, if it's not able to be repeated, if you can't demonstrate it, it's not science. It's a theory. It's a belief system. If you can't repeat it. So be very careful what you call actual science. There are a lot of things said in the name of science that are not scientific at all. They're not. So it's very important that we understand what science really is. It has to be able to be proven. Um, and so there are some Bible-believing Christians who are against using any form of science. I'll say this, that uh, the Bible stands on its own. I don't need scientists to prove it for me. I don't need archaeologists to prove it for me. I don't need historicists to prove it for me. It stands on its own. That being said, the science, the history, the archaeology, uh, all those things back up what the Bible says. So I, I love to come across passages in the Bible where there's no way anyone could have known this but God. Okay, There's no way anybody could have put these things down but God. Let me give you an example here. Uh, the book of Job you know, written a long time ago, penned down, God's words penned down a long time ago. Look at Job 38. This is a record of God speaking to Job. Let's just begin 38.1. It says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. And he's going to ask Job a bunch of questions that Job cannot answer. Verse 4. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Hey, God said, I was there at the beginning. Where were you, Job? I was there at the beginning. Where were you, writers of the science textbooks? Where were you, Charles Darwin? I was there in the beginning. I created it. I made it. I'm telling you how this went down. You can believe me or you can believe some man who put together a science textbook and is now dead in the grave and lost. You, you can believe who you want to believe, but I'm telling you, I was there. I created it. Look at verse 5. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut up the sea with doors? 
when it brake forth as if it had issued out of the womb, when I made the cloud the garment thereof, and thick darkness a swaddling band for it, and brake up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said to the sea, Hitherto shalt thou come, and but no further. And here shall thou pry, thy proud waves be stayed. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days, and caused the day spring to know his place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it? It is turned. He's talking here about the earth's rotation. It is turned as clay to the seal, like, like a seal that they would roll. If you've ever seen... Uh, some old documentaries, some history channel documentaries, they'd take some seals that just looked like a cylinder and they'd roll those through the wax. That's what he's talking about, that rotation. Notice, it is turned as clay to the seal. It's rotating. And they stand as a garment. And from the wicked their light is withholden, and the high arm shall be broken. And again, there are many examples here, but I want to show you this one. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Or hast thou walked in the search of the depth? Have the gates of death been opened unto thee? Or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth? Declare if thou knowest it all. Job, do you know everything? Hey, science textbook writers, do you know everything? God says, I do. I created it all. I want you to see an example here. Many, many, many years before we could have even thought to research this place, God's word says very clearly, because God created it, in verse 16, he says, hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Or hast thou walked in the search of the depth? Well, let's start at the end of that verse, first of all, the, the depth of the sea. The deepest part that we know of in the sea is in the Pacific Ocean, and it is how deep? Somebody tell me. About how many miles deep? About seven miles deep, close to seven. So if you go outside and you look at a plane flying way up in the air, we're talking about you know 35,000 feet. When that plane looks about that big, think about from your toes to that plane's nose, that's how deep the ocean is in the deepest part that we know about. That's pretty deep. And it wasn't until the last century in all the history of the world, it wasn't until the last century that we were able to go down and take a look at what's there. But more than that, I want you to see this. Go to the beginning of that verse. He says, hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Again, realize this is penned down. Now, this isn't man writing this. This is not Job writing this. This is God using men to pen his words down. And God says, hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? He said, did you know in the sea there are springs? Everybody know what springs are? They come up out of the ground. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Springs come up out of the ground. Uh, Abe Lincoln's birthplace. How many of you ever been to Abe Lincoln's birthplace? Not too far from here. One of the reasons his family moved there is because there were natural springs, freshwater springs that came up out of the ground. And especially back in those days, that's, you absolutely had to have a source of water like that. And uh, so they, they had a place where the water came up out of the ground. Well, right here, God's word says that there are actually springs in the sea. So in the sea... There are springs that come up out of the depths of the ground. Did you know it was in 1977 that the springs of the sea were discovered? It's hot, it's hot water venting out of the earth coming up out of the sea, discovered in 1977. How many of you think the Bible was written before 1977? Okay. The point is this. Who could have known that? But God. But God. Again, there are multitudes of examples. Let's go back just to, let's talk about a barber shop for a minute. How many of you know what the little pole, the barber's pole stands for? Who knows what the red on the barber pole stands for? Does anybody know? What does it stand for? What is it? They used to let blood. Yeah. So they would take their razors. This is absolutely truth. They'd go read this in history. They would take their razors and they would cut people. And the, the logic behind it was they're bleeding out the bad blood. So, you know, if you're sick, what you really need is a little bloodletting. You know, you need to go to the barber so he can cut on you and so you can bleed a little bit. 
Uh, say, oh, that's foolish. Yeah, but, but that was the logic of man. See, see, we're always foolish if we follow the logic of man. And we're always wise if we'll just believe God's word. Now, long before that, and by the way, how many of you know how George Washington died? That way, they, they bled out too much of the bad blood. <laughs> he died of blood loss because they were bleeding the bad blood from him. But if they just read their Bible that God wrote and just believe God's word, he made it very clear that the life is in the blood, right? And th these are just a couple of examples. And I'm just saying how many more, if a person doesn't want to believe the Bible, they're not going to believe the Bible, no matter what you show them. I I've, I've shown you that about archaeology, how that for years they could not find proof of the Hittites. They had proof of all these other people groups, but they couldn't find the Hittites, so what'd they say? Well, see, the Bible's just man-made, and it's all false, it's phony. And then guess what? Suddenly they discover proof for the Hittites. So you think, they said, oh, well, you know, we better believe the Bible. Did they do that? No, they found another excuse why they won't believe the Bible. And this is exactly what Jesus said in Luke 16 when he talked about the rich man in hell. And by the way, he wasn't in hell because he was rich. He was in hell because he was an unbeliever, because he did not trust Christ. And the Bible says, he said... If somebody would rise from the dead, go to my father's house, testify to my brethren, then they'll be saved, then they'll repent, then they'll listen. He said, no. He said, they have Moses and the prophets. You know what that is? That's the Old Testament scripture. He said, if they won't be persuaded by Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Because again, somebody did rise from the dead. Folks have risen from the dead. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. We celebrate that every Sunday. 500 witnesses. And, and this is interesting. His enemies, who so badly wanted to prove he didn't rise from the dead, they couldn't even show his body. Why? Because he rose from the dead. Just like he said, as the over 500 witnesses made clear. The point is this. If you don't want to believe the Bible, you just won't believe the Bible. It, but God's word is replete with examples of proofs, scientific, historical, archaeological, that God's word is true. You know, here, here's again this perfect example, the springs of the sea. Well, how do you know they're there? Because God said they're there. How do you know? And that was just discovered in 1977, you know, actually observed. So the point is this. God's word is true, and God's point is in the beginning, God. God said, I was there. I created all of it. You just need to take my word. I'm telling you how it happened in the beginning. Now, I want to go on to the next part of Genesis 1. Let's go back to Genesis 1, please. So the Bible makes it very clear, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And then we come to uh, this verse, it says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. We have the creation of light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, I've said this before. The truth of God's word is actually very simple. It really is. But simplicity, the, the pride of man says, I want something to be more complicated. I want something that nobody else can possibly understand without me. So there's a lot of false teaching regarding these verses of creation. And it's tearing down those false belief systems that takes a little bit longer. But the truth is simple. What's the truth? The truth is God said, let there be light, and there was light. That's the truth. The truth is it was in one literal 24-hour day. The evening and the morning were the first day. Do you see in that verse any wiggle room... To say, actually, God didn't mean day. He didn't actually mean 24 hours. He actually meant millions and millions of years. Do any of you see any wiggle room in that verse? At all? Do you see any? No. It says the evening and the morning were the first day. The first day. Say, so why do you bring this up? I bring this up because in Schofield's notes, and there are many people who claim to be smart, who say that this is a relevant theory it's called the gap theory. And the reason I'm bringing it up is that this is prominent. People want to sound smart. They want to sound educated. So they throw these things out that aren't anywhere in the Bible. Okay? 
So what people teach is, well, actually between each of these days, they weren't actually days. They were actually eras. They were periods of millions and millions of years. And so God actually over time, see, the, let me tell you the reason they're doing this, okay? The reason they're doing this is to try to find a compromise between creation and evolution. And some would even call this theistic evolution. And here's what that means. Oh, yeah, I, oh, I believe God created everything. Absolutely. But then God just kind of took his hands off of everything. And again, if you don't believe this, you may say, why are you even spending time on this? Because this is actually fairly popular teaching. It's actually a fairly popular belief system. God created everything, but then he took his hands off everything, let everything go out spinning into space for millions and millions and millions of years. And so these things evolved over time. So, so yeah, God, you know, he started everything. He, he got the engine going, the evolution engine going. But then, you know, evolution and the evolutionary processes took over. Well, again, I'll say that that is a matter of, that's your belief system because, first of all, that's not science. You can't repeat that. You can't demonstrate that. It's a faith system. You say, well, what you believe is faith too. Absolutely. I just take God for his word. What he said is he said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, what I want you to notice, very interesting, is he created light before there was a sun. Notice the sun wasn't even created yet. He created light before there's a moon. He created light before there are stars. Say, but don't we have to have sun to get light? No, we have to have God to have light. Amen. He created light. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in Revelation, there'll be no need of the sun because he is the light. The Bible says God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. But notice, the light was created before there's a sun. The light was created before there's a moon. The light's created before there are any stars. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And it doesn't say it took millions of years. And, and by the way, let's revisit that little gap theory thing. Let's say it did, let's pretend their theory is viable, okay? Uh, plants were created before creatures. Plants were created before creatures. How many of you are aware, and you learned this in science class, that the vast majority of plants need creatures to help pollinate them? Yeah, especially crops, especially food. Food or uh, matters of uh, uh, plants used for industry, 80%, about 80% of crops, things we eat, or things used for industry, things made to make things. Those plants, eight, about 80% of them require pollination. Well, how would that have gone for things if the plants evolved over millions and millions of years and had nothing to help pollinate them? Now, I know there are plants that are self-pollinated. There are plants that are pollinated by the wind. I get that. I understand that. But I'm just saying, let's use common sense here for a minute. Let's just, how about this? Let's just take God at his word, right? Amen. Let's just believe what God said. If we believe what God said, we won't chase down paths of foolishness. He said, let there be light. There was light before there was a sun, before there was a moon. In fact, go back to Job. Look at Job 38. And uh, I, I've heard some people try to explain what this means. All I can tell you is there was light without a sun, light without a moon, light without stars. And all I can tell you is God is asking Job questions here he can't explain. He can't answer. And the reason Job is, God is asking Job these questions is to say, Job, you're not God. I am. Job, you weren't there when I created everything. I was. So you need to just trust me and take my word for things. How many of you have ever told your kids? And I think it's good to tell your kids why sometimes. I don't think you should just never tell them why. I think it's good. The Bible says knowledge is easy unto him that understandeth. If your kids can understand why you're doing something, it helps them to learn that truth. But how many of you, when your kids were little, or sometimes you just had to tell them, look, you just have to trust me. You just have to do it because I said so, because you're not going to understand. How many of you ever had to tell them that? Of course. Because they had a certain knowledge base, and you knew they would not understand. You just confused them further. The point is, God is God for a reason. There are things he understands we don't understand. But what I know is this, he created light without sun, moon, and stars. And I want you to see what he said to Job. Look at Job 38. And again, there are ex explanations of this, but the point is this. Light doesn't require a source like a sun or a star. You know, another uh, sun is a star. It doesn't require a source like that. 
God created light without those things. Look at Job 38, verse 19. After he asked Job, declare if thou knowest it all. Do you know everything, Job? Then he said this, verse 19. Where is the way where light dwelleth? And as for darkness, where is the place thereof? Job, do you know? No, you don't, but I do. God says, verse 20, that thou shouldest take it to the bound thereof, and that thou shouldest know the paths to the house thereof. Job, do you know the path to get to light and the path to get to darkness? Do you know where they, they dwell? Do you know where they live? Verse 21, knowest thou it because thou wast then born, or because the number of thy days is great? You know, if we live 80 years, that's 30,000 days. That goes like that, doesn't it? You know, you live, live 100 years. That's a few more, 36,000 days. That's a lot. That seems like a long time. Oh, it's so short. When my dad was getting ready to go to heaven, he, he went to heaven at 83, I think it was. One of the things he said, 83, he's, life's so short. He said, boy, it went so fast. That's what he said. You know, it doesn't matter how long you live. You live it to be 100. Were, were we there when everything was created? No, we weren't. Do we have all wisdom, all knowledge? I mean, it seems like the older you get, the more you learn, and then, you know, it's almost time to go to heaven. It's like, well, I wish I'd learned those things when I was 20 or when I was 15 or, you know. But now I've learned those things, and it's about time to go to heaven. Um, the, the point God is saying to Job, Job, you weren't there. I'm telling you, there's a place for light. There's a place, there's a way where light dwelleth. As for darkness, where is the place thereof? The point is this. God created light before he created the sun, the moon, the stars, he created the light. Um, and it was in a literal day, not millions and millions of years. Go to Exodus 20. Look at Exodus 20. God's word is very clear. Six literal days God created the earth, the heaven and the earth. Look at Exodus chapter 20, <clears throat> verse number 11. Exodus chapter 20, verse number 11. This is part of the Ten Commandments says, for in, what are the next two words? Uh, we're in Exodus chapter 20. Let me give you time to get there. Exodus chapter 20, verse number 11. It says, for in, what are the next two words? Six days. The Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. What do you think God, let's, let's think deeply here for a minute. What do you think God meant by six days? He meant six days. That's what he meant. He didn't mean six periods of millions and millions of years. See, it's the people with lots of letters after their name have to tell you, well, see, it really meant this. No, no, no. It means exactly what God said. In six days, the Lord made heaven and the earth. Again, this is a, an attempt to marry evolution and creation, and they will not join together. They will not. God did not create everything and then start the evolutionary process and send us off spinning into space to evolve. No, he created these things literally the way he said he did. I want you to see the next thing he created. Look at Genesis 1, verse 6. It says, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. What's a firmament? Well, let's look at it. Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. <clears throat> and let it divide the waters from the waters. So this firmament, whatever it is, it's dividing the waters from the waters, okay? So, verse 7 says, And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So on the second day, first day, God created light. Second day, he creates the firmament. And what does the firmament, firmament do? It divides the waters underneath from the waters above. So, and he called it what? He called it heaven. So what, what is he talking about heaven? Well, there are three heavens the Bible talks about. And, and listen to Amos chapter 9, verse 6. It says, speaking of God, it says, It is he that buildeth his stories. In the heaven. How many of you know what a story is in a building? You know, if you say it's a 10-story building, what does that mean? It has 10 floors, right? It's 10 levels, right? So the Bible says here, Amos 9, that God buildeth stories in the heaven. There are multiple levels, floors, layers, if you want to call it that, 
of heaven. In fact, there are three the Bible tells us of. The first one, the first heaven, we would just call it simply the sky. It's where the birds fly. And I want you to see this. Um, in fact, before we dig into that, let's go to Job again. Go back to Job 37. We're going to go back and forth to Job probably a lot. Uh, Job 37, please. Look at Job 37, verse 14. So the second day, God creates the firmament, which he called heaven. And there are three stories of heaven, three levels of heaven. And it's not the way the Mormons teach it either, by the way. Now, I'm going to show you exactly what the Bible says are these three stories of heaven. But look at Job 37, verse number 14. Job 37, verse 14, he says, Hearken unto this, O Job, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Dost thou know when God disposed them and caused the light of his cloud to shine? Dost thou know the balancings of the clouds? By the way, does anybody know what clouds are made of? Mainly, what are they made of? Water, right? Dost thou know the balancings of the clouds, the wondrous works of him which is perfect in knowledge? How thy garments are warm when he quieteth the earth by the south wind? Hast thou with him spread out the sky? which is strong and as a molten looking glass. No, God did that. We didn't do it. God did. Go to Psalm 104. Psalm 104. And look at verses 1 through 3. Psalm 104, verses 1 through 3. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretchest out the heavens like a curtain, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. God created the firmament. Let, let me read this quickly. Uh, how vast is God's universe? Pretend the earth were a grape, the size of a grape. In proportion, the sun would be the size of a beach ball and would be 163 yards away. Try, try to picture that for a minute. A little less than two football fields. The largest planet in our solar system, Jupiter, would be about the size of a grapefruit. It'd be about five blocks up the road. And what about our nearest star next to us? In our scaled-down universe, the nearest star would still be 24,000 miles away. Almost, almost all the way around the globe. That's how far the nearest star would be on the scale we're proposing here. If the earth were that grape, the Milky Way, in a proportionate size, would still be 55 billion miles wide. Say, are those exact numbers? Even if they're not, the point is, it's really big. That's the point. And the universe is filled with other galaxies who can imagine the size of the universe? The point is, we have a really big God who created everything. He's an amazing God. Notice, let me read this. If we possessed an atlas of our galaxy, an atlas. Does anybody still know what an atlas is? <laughs> Some people are like, what is an atlas? You know, are you talking about Google Maps? You know, uh, How many of you still use an atlas or still have one? You get, how many aren't ashamed to admit it? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. I think I might have one. I don't know. Um, if we possessed an atlas of our galaxy that, for some of you still have no clue what I'm talking about, it's a book full of maps is what it is, okay? Uh, if we possessed an atlas of our galaxy that devoted just a single page to every star system in just the Milky Way, so that the sun, all its planets were on one page, that atlas would be 10 million volumes of 10,000 pages, it would take a library the size of Harvard's to house the atlas and merely to flip through it at the rate of one page a second would take you 10,000 years. And there are many, 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 many more galaxies than that. The point is, the point is, are we really going to stand here on this little earth and say, God, we can tell you, God, we don't believe what your word says. We're going to tell you how it all started. No, we should just listen to him. We should just say, you know what? He knows a whole lot more than I do. I better listen. Um, right here, God created the firmament. What is it? It's the heaven. And the first heaven is the sky where birds fly. Look at Genesis 1.20. He uses the word again. God said, let the waters, this is another day we'll study later, but he said, it says, God said, let the waters 
Bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So that's the first heaven, what we would call the sky. Um, in fact, let's look at another place. Go to Deuteronomy, uh, the fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 11, and look at verse number 11. Deuteronomy 11, uh, verse number 11, the Bible says, But the land, whither ye go to possess it, is a land of hills and valleys, and drinketh water of the rain of heaven. So what heaven are we talking about there? The first heaven, the sky. That's what we're talking about. Then there's a second heaven. What's the second heaven? We'll go to Psalm 8. Psalm 8. Remember, God put stories in his heaven. He put levels. He put floors in his heaven. He has three, three levels to his heaven. Notice Psalm 8, verse number 3. The second heaven is what we would call outer space. We would call the second heaven outer space. Look at Psalm 8, verse 3. He says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Isn't that amazing? And the son of man that thou visitest him. You think of how big God's creation is, and yet he cared enough to send his only begotten son to this little marble to save us. What an awesome God. Uh, look at back in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Again, I want to show you this. The second heaven is where the sun, moon, and stars are. Where Planets, the galaxies, what we would call outer space. Look at Genesis 1. Verse 14, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens. So again, these are created after he created light. Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. He's talking about the sun, moon, and stars. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. So the first heaven is what we would call the what? We would call where the birds fly. We call that the sky. We'd typically call it that. The second heaven is what we would typically call outer space. And then the third heaven is where God's throne is, where God dwells. And I want you to see this. Go to Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel. Chapter 1 and verse 26, Ezekiel 1, verse 26, Ezekiel sees God in the third heaven where his throne is. Ezekiel 1, 26 says, And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about it. This was the appearance of of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, Jesus said to pray daily, Our Father which art in what? Heaven. That's the third heaven. Uh, Hebrews seven twenty six says that Jesus is higher than the heavens. His name is above every name. He's higher than the heavens. Uh, go to 2 Corinthians 12. Paul talks about going to the third heaven. Heaven, um, I personally believe this is when Paul was stoned to death. I think he did die and God brought him back. No, that's when I believe it happened. I, can't, I would never argue with somebody over that. I couldn't prove it to you. That's just what I believe from what I've read in Scripture. But 2 Corinthians 12, look at verse 2. Paul writes, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Notice what he says, whether in the body I cannot tell. Or whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. I don't know if I was still in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Such an one caught up to the what? What does it say? The third heaven. Where is that? That's where God dwells. When our loved ones go to, go to heaven, where do they go? The third heaven. To be absent from the body is present with the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. 
in that third heaven. Go to Psalm 33. We're going to get as far as we can this week and we'll review a little bit of this next week and continue on in Genesis 1. I don't want to rush through these first couple of chapters. I really want to take the time uh, to dig into these. Um, Psalm 33, and look at verse 13 and 14. It says, The Lord looketh from heaven. That's the third heaven. He beholdeth all the sons of men from the place of his habitation. He looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He can see us from his heaven. Look at verse 6 of Psalm 33. It says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as an heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. We ought to admit he is an awesome God. We ought to stand in awe of him. We should treat his word with awe, respect, reverence. We, we, we don't need to be these Bible deniers, these Bible doubters who say they have to marry creation with evolution. No, let's just take God's word for it. Let's just realize his word is truth. We need to stand in awe of him. Verse 9, for he spake and it was done. He, it's not he spake and then it had to evolve over millions of years. No, he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. He created the light before the sun, moon, and stars. He created the firmament, the heaven, the sky, outer space, and heaven where he dwells. And he created that heaven, that firmament, to divide the waters from the waters. I'm just going to end with this very quickly. Um, how many of you have ever flown in a plane? How many of you have never flown in a plane and are glad you haven't? Okay, yeah, several. several. Um, I still get nervous when I fly in a plane to some degree. But, when you get, but I enjoy it too. When you get up above the clouds, how many of you know what I'm talking about? You get up above the clouds, it just looks like a sea, right? You know what those are? Those are waters above the waters. And the firmament was designed to divide the waters from above, from the waters. Um, there is a theory that, hey, maybe there was a better canopy over the earth at one time, which is why things grew bigger. And there's abundant proof of that. Things grew bigger, lived longer. There's absolute proof of that. So there are theories, and pro probably true, that, that the waters above the waters, it was a better uh, protection of some sort from the UV rays of the sun. And so things, almost like living in a, uh, a hyperbaric chamber, you know, that there was greater barometric pressure. There was, there was if, if you've ever heard of that, athletes sometimes, if they have surgery, um, they'll, some of them who are wealthy, I think a quarterback just did this last year, he bought his own little hyperbaric chamber. And why did he do that? Because that extra pressure in the atmosphere helps you to, uh, helps you to heal faster. And things grow bigger. They've grown tomatoes, absolutely true. They've grown tomatoes the size of basketballs. Absolutely true. In conditions where they've added pressure, more pounds per square inch in the atmosphere. The point is this, that there was probably more waters above the waters than there are now. But you can still see the waters above the waters, the clouds. That's water above the waters. And that's what the sky was designed to do, divide the waters from the waters. The Bible says the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. But God built stories in heaven. He made the sky. He made outer space. And that's heaven where he dwells. And by the way, if you're not saved, you don't know Christ as your Savior. You don't know that you're going to heaven. You can trust him as your Savior today. You can leave here knowing that someday heaven will be your home. Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its truth. And thank you that you've told us the beginning from the end and everything in between. And that you, Lord, have told us about the beginnings of our earth. Lord, help us just to simply trust you. There's abundant proof that you've told us the truth. There's abundant proof, but help us just by faith to believe your word. You told us to trust in you with all our heart. Lean not to our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge you, and you would direct our paths. So help us to trust you enough that we'll live our lives based on your word. Bless in the next hour, I pray. If there be someone here that is not saved, may they be saved today. In Jesus' name, amen. We're dismissed for about 7.30.